Hi, I'm Darlene Newman, and I'm taking a swan boat ride today in Asbury Park as we explore the intersection of architecture and history to reveal community and culture. We're looking up in Asbury Park, New Jersey, where the sounds of doo-wop, rock and roll from the likes of Bruce Springsteen and Bon Jovi, and jazz, rhythm, and blues from icons like Duke Ellington and Billie Holiday became the creative foundation for a generation of local entrepreneurs and artists. We're walking back in time through the structures and sounds that bring the strong community of this Jersey Shore town to life. From the Pride Parade and nightlife to African-American music history, a roller coaster of decline and development, and modern renovations with a hook in the past. We're diving into Asbury Park with locals as our guides, starting on the boardwalk with Don Stein. So what was Asbury Park like in the early days? Oh, Asbury Park was booming. If you wanted to come to the shore and stay in a nice hotel, or if you lived in Monmouth and Ocean Counties and you wanted to do fine shopping, you came to Asbury Park. So this is a classic beach town in the Jersey Shore. Oh, yeah, it always has been, 450 years. A brush manufacturer named James A. Bradley, he made a lot of money during the Civil War. He came out here to go to Ocean Grove. It was founded as a Methodist tent revival. And Bradley bought 500 acres north of Ocean Grove, and he named it Asbury Park. So eventually he sold the boardwalk and they let alcohol in, and that's when Asbury Park became the party destination. That's Convention Hall. It's got a beautiful theater in it. And they always had concerts in the 60s, The Stones, The Doors, Janis Joplin, probably at Asbury Park's most iconic building, Convention Hall. Listed on the National Register of Historic Places, Asbury Park Convention Hall was built in 1930 to be the finest structure of its kind along the Atlantic coast and was designed by the illustrious New York architectural firm, Warren and Wetmore, the architects for New York City's Grand Central Station and St. James Theater. Influenced by French, Italian, and maritime themes, the style is an example of eclecticism, employing two or more types of design, and to me, seems to go along well with the eclectic nature of Asbury Park. Don walks me through Convention Hall to a spot on the boardwalk where the SS Morrow Castle, an ocean liner being towed while on fire, ran aground atop an earlier wreck. And the Morrow Castle was still on fire, like it ended up exactly on top of the new era shipwreck. That same spot had claimed a clipper ship called the New Era some 80 years before in a tragedy. The Moros wreck in 1934 would bring thousands of tourists to watch the grisly scene from shore. Both disasters resulted in changes to laws to make sailing and, and cruising on ships better. From disaster came something good, but Don reveals a tale about the 1854 New Era wreck in which a ship's surgeon tried to abscond with a bag of silver and gold from the passengers during the tragedy. And the lifeboat went out, and he fell between the ship and the lifeboat, and it came back and crushed him. So out there, there's a big bag of money somewhere <laughs> in this land, okay? <laughs> Asbury Park has a fascinating history. Oh, it does. If people don't know, it's, oh yeah, there's so much here that's, you know, people don't know about. Other public buildings were built along the boardwalk too. Paramount Theater, the Asbury Park Casino, and the Carousel House. The Carousel House still stands, and that's where I'm meeting Jen Hampton. She helped launch the Wooden Walls Mural Project. She inspired artists to design and paint murals on the wood of boarded up buildings in Asbury Park. And the project has taken off throughout the city. Artists from around the world have come to Asbury Park to participate. Today, dozens of murals allow visitors to lose themselves on a street art tour, including in the old Carousel House. I look at our architectural buildings as our first public art. And so I feel like I'm just honoring another, a tradition that's been here since the 20s. It's just the art changes. Obviously, it had its life protecting a carousel, but... And now it protects our... <laughs> I know! Now it protects our artists and art. So the buildings inspired me. It was my love letter to Asbury Park because it's the muse that inspired me, and then I hope to give people the platform to be inspired as well. 
it's your love letter, and then it's the love letter of artists that are from here, from the rest of the U.S., from yep. the rest of the world. Yep. You know, everybody comes here to see music, but while you're here, there's art to see and engage with and galleries, and so that's my big lofty goal is, like, how can art change the fabric of our community? A short walk away from the Carousel House, we're taking a trip down music memory lane with Tony Pellegrosi. He started his career as a trumpet player in the band Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes, often headlining at the classic music venue, The Stone Pony. Well, I'm seeing Bruce Springsteen in the E Street Band. Right. Who are some of the names I would recognize that have played here at Stone Pony? Well, Elvis Costello, Cheap Trick, The Black Crows, uh, No Doubt, Skid Row. All these songs make... are going off in my head yeah, right now. Yeah, just about every band that became big. This was one of the clubs that they played when they were still a club band. I was standing right over there in that corner. That's where the horn section, the Jukes horn section stood. The first time that Bruce got on stage with us, pretty soon after I joined the band, that was very exciting. This town had, you know, 15, 20,000 people in it, and you were getting major stars. Perhaps over a thousand artists have played on that stage. There are very few clubs that have been doing what the Stone Pony has done throughout its history who are still here and are still very viable and still very much in the minds of the public. If these walls could talk or sing the stories they would tell. Well, yeah, especially the after hour stories. <laughs> we won't ask you to reveal them. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't remember them, which means I was really here. <laughs> The late 19th century saw the rise of Victorian homes in Asbury Park, and the later development of the boardwalk gave birth to a flourishing industry of hotels, shops, and restaurants. Hundreds of thousands of tourists would visit every summer, not just from New Jersey, but Philadelphia, New York City, and beyond. But the history in Asbury Park hasn't always been easy breezy. Transportation changes, violence in the 1970s, economic decline, and suburban sprawl would all be contributing factors to why residents moved away and tourism declined over many decades. But Asbury Park has been on the rise once again over the last 20 years, with new developments and a renaissance of arts, culture, and food. We're taking a walk to see more of the historic structures and symbols that survived the decades and the community members who took a chance to bring Asbury Park back to better days. Starting with Tim McClune, who started a supper club in a retro Howard Johnson, which survived demolition. It's located along the boardwalk. There's something unique about Asbury that everybody knows. It's a very romantic attachment that I have. And of course, the whole Bruce mystique and the whole the, the music that came out of here. We were the first lease signers down here in uh, 2007 when they decided to redevelop the boardwalk. Tell me a little bit about this space. This was an old Howard Johnson. Right. When we first opened up, we actually still sold clam strips, the Hojo's clam strips. And this is the second floor, and we made it into a supper club. We spent a lot of money on the acoustics, and it's rich as could be. I would, I would love to hear the acoustics. I don't know if there's anything you can play. Who, me? <laughs> <laughs> Just a few numbers. Well, I recently <laughs> wrote this, and then I wrote, you know, wrote the, <laughs> see if I can get this here. Clouds of blue are waiting outside my door. It doesn't seem to shine as much anymore. And when it rains, it's really more like it pours. Since you got over me, look in the mirror now. What do I see? Try to understand what's happened to me. The shadow of a man that I used to be since you got over me. Nervous. You're pulling on my heartstrings. <laughs> <laughs> Just across from Tim McLoon's Supper Club, Debbie DeLisa welcomes people and pets to the Wonder Bar. Outside, a replica of Smiling Tilly reminds us of Asbury Park's 1950s amusement park past. Debbie is such an advocate for animals. They have this amazing yappy hour going on. If you love dog watching, which is one of my particular favorite pastimes, this is it. And we're in this iconic building here. 
right across from Convention Hall. Famous people played there. Bruce Springsteen and other amazing artists have played here. And this is a real community feel at the Wonder Bar. Here you go. Ooh, thank you, Debbie. You're welcome. Yeah. Enjoy it. looks so good. Here you go. Now let's try this burger. I love a good grilled burger when the outside is nicely charred. Um, it screams summer. Even though we're not here in Asbury Park in summer, it screams summer fun to me. The LGBTQ plus community has been a huge part of Asbury Park's revitalization. Entrepreneurs took their chances opening up new businesses in the early 2000s, like Russell Lewis at Watermark. Cheers. Cheers to you. So here we are on the Asbury Park Boardwalk. I've been lucky enough to come uh, and look at this view every day for the past 15 years, and I gotta tell you, it does not get old. How did you decide to open up here? I bought a house um, here in Asbury in, in 2004, but there just wasn't a cocktail culture. So a little bulb went off and said, oh, you know, whoever opens up a, a really cool progressive cocktail lounge could really kill it here. We wanted to create a place that was modern and progressive, but also homey, comfortable, a little refined and upscale, but not pretentious and snooty. Unpretentious, welcoming, homey, cozy. It's what I hear a lot of people saying about Asbury Park. It's incredible, the diversity in Asbury Park the different cultures and the different people and the different languages that you hear just walking up and down this Jersey Shore boardwalk town. It's truly remarkable. It's not just the boardwalk where the LGBTQ plus community has opened up businesses to bring people back to Asbury Park. It's happening in the historic downtown at places like Taka and Moonstruck. Let's start with sushi. For a year, definitely an inspiring entrepreneur, but you came to the USA from Japan, and it wasn't easy. I didn't know anything about Asbury Park, but everybody was talking about it 18 years ago, even 20 years ago, when I moved this town. Asbury is coming back. Then the uh, first five years, uh, it really struggled, then catch up slowly, slowly. Today, Taka's restaurant is super popular, drawing in people to downtown Asbury Park for sushi fusion that's tasty. Moonstruck's move from Ocean Grove to downtown Asbury Park resulted in the major renovation of an old, deteriorating Victorian building, recalls Moonstruck's Howard Rochkowitz. And uh, this building was vacant, sitting for a long time. It had been a nightclub. It had been different things over the years. When we purchased the building in 2000, I took pictures of all of the storefronts on a three-block stretch behind us on Cookman Avenue. Every store had been boarded up or closed or vacated. It was a gamble at the time, but it was a rebirth. You know, I love supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs when I'm traveling, and there are a lot of choices here in Asbury Park. I heard there was a really special bakery that specializes in rock and roll pastries. Confections of a Rockstar Bakery is run by former rock and roll drummer, Kimmy Massey, who helps me decide on what delicious treat to taste a cranberry pistachio scone or a Pop-Tart. Pop-Tart. There is nothing like a homemade Pop-Tart. And this is delicious. The strawberry, the flaky pastry, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Asbury Park's LGBTQ plus community didn't just burgeon with new restaurants in the early 2000s. Back in the early 1990s, Laura Popple helped bring the Pride Parade to Asbury Park. 1992 was the first year of the Pride Parade here in Asbury Park, but why Asbury Park and why at that time? The community had just come off of a successful eight-year campaign to have our law against discrimination at the state level amended to include sexual orientation. At the time, we were only the fifth state in the country, so we set out to do a Pride Parade, a Pride event here in New Jersey, a statewide one. Asbury Park at that time had business and uh, resident community, LGBTQ plus community, and we couldn't come up with anything that was more quintessentially New Jersey than our boardwalk. And so we felt this would be the perfect um, destination. So here we are. Every year we come back to it. So I feel pretty good about Asbury as our partner. With the parade and restaurants comes nightlife too. The Empress is a hotel resort dating back to the 1960s, catering to families originally. Judy Garland and Liza Minnelli once vacationed at the Empress. And today, the original structure has been transformed, keeping historic details alive. Tonight, it's the place to be for drag bingo. 
And though I don't win a prize, I have fun getting to know more of Asbury Park's diverse community. During the late 1800s to the early 1900s, there were lots of grand hotels in Asbury Park. Not many have survived. Over time, many of the visitors, instead of staying for the whole summer and the whole weekend, became day trippers. So we no longer needed hundreds and hundreds of hotels. Grand hotels, cottages, boarding houses. I meet Kay Harris, president of the Asbury Park Historical Society at the Berkeley Hotel, one of the few of these grand hotels to survive. So the uh, Berkeley Oceanfront Hotel, which was originally called the Berkeley Carteret Hotel, was actually designed by uh, Warren and Wetmore. And they're the same architects who actually designed the Convention Hall in the Paramount, as well as the Grand Central Station in New York. So neat to be in this iconic old hotel and then to look out across and see all the amazing architecture that's still preserved here in Asbury Park. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that we almost take for granted. And unfortunately, we have lost several structures, but we are trying to preserve those that we have left. Kay's organization, the Asbury Park Historical Society, now occupies the Stephen Crane House, former home of the prolific short story writer who wrote The Red Badge of Courage. It was completely gutted, it was boarded up, it was abandoned. So the story of the Stephen Crane House, if you're looking for a building that really encapsulates Asbury Park history from the 1870s to the present, this is the place. A story of ruin and rescue and redemption and reimagining in the new century. It's a place Tom Chesick has... shares the story of Asbury Park during Crane's time here. He began his writing career while he was living here as a teenager. Asbury, of course, in the Gilded Age was uh, quite the fancy resort. People like Oscar Wilde and the Prince of Wales, and you know, they all flocked to Asbury in those days. He had uh, kind of a love-hate relationship, I would say, with Asbury. His father was a prominent minister in North Jersey. He had passed away by the time they moved here. Everything that his father invade against, you know, uh, drinking, smoking, dancing, carousing, and music, uh, this is all stuff that Stevie was into. <laughs> There's now a community push to keep buildings like the Stephen Crane House preserved and to restore others with a strong cultural legacy. You know, there was an urgency to capture the stories and share it with the next generation. Jennifer Sounder and Yvonne Clayton meet me in a church by Springwood Avenue. They're part of the Asbury Park African American Music Project, working to revitalize a historic music club along Springwood Avenue, the Turf Club. I grew up here, so I remember the Springwood Avenue that used to be, that you could walk down the street and there was music coming out of the stores and the nightclubs. And I, I couldn't go in, but I could hear the music. And musicians, on their breaks, they would go from one club to the other just to hear the music playing. We knew the Turf Club was there, the last standing music venue. And this was a safe place, especially for African Americans to come and be entertained without fear, without discrimination. And it became our goal to see what we could do to preserve that building. Yvonne and I and a group of a small group of people decided um, to just work together on documenting the stories and the musicians. All of these musicians showed up that were still here. That's how we first found Vel Johnson. As far as I can remember, the music scene was unbelievable. It was part of the reason why I'm even here right now because it's just all kind of, you absorb it all. And, uh, the turf was a major part of the music scene here. I wrote a song before the turf. It's called A Night at the Turf. For us, this project speaks to our hearts, and that is to reopen that building and make it a place where live music can be heard on Springwood Avenue once again. In Asbury Park's residential neighborhoods, I find another architectural treasure, the Asbury Park Public Library. Listed on the National Register of Historic Places, it has an original Lewis Comfort Tiffany stained glass window designed by artist Theodore Russell Davis. Mayor, your family has deep roots here in Asbury Park. Yes, my great-grandfather moved to Asbury Park in 1888. 
It's a great place to meet three-term Mayor John Moore for coffee and further insight into Asbury Park's past and future. How did the renaissance happen? Because there's a continued renaissance happening here in Asbury Park. Organically, small businesses, small stores that have brought back the city and made it a mecca for the entire county, if not the state. And then developers came in and said, money can be made here. And they've done some fantastic developments. Every year, like we're named like number one or number two beach in the country, we're number one or two boardwalk. We get so much credit because of all the work put in by so many. Another structure standing strong and well supported by the locals is Frank Steli, where owner Joe Maggio has become famous for serving a Central Jersey tradition. One, pork two, roll, three, egg and cheese. Yeah. Three, three, three thick slides. slice of pork roll, <laughs> cheese, and an egg on top, fried egg on a poppy roll. So if I travel to Washington, you know, D.C., Virginia, Pennsylvania, not going to find it. I heard that there's a little bit of a maybe a controversy. If you're in Hoboken, Jersey City, it's Taylor Ham. Come south of the Edison Bridge, it's pork roll. Now, why? What, why? No idea why, just the way it is. How long has Frank Steli been around? 1960 oh, yeah. we opened, and I've been working here since 1969. Six Seven days. decades. You came in and you just didn't leave. That's it. My <laughs> father didn't feel good. He went home one day, he left me on the grill, and he said, Joe, take over, and I'm still here. I love bacon, egg, and cheese. Big fan of breakfast, so this I'm excited to try. There you go. Mm. This is delicious. Good sandwich, yeah. Cheese, that pork, and the fact that you've seared it. How many of these pork roll egg and cheese do you sell each week? Probably about a thousand or so. That's a lot of pork roll. A lot of pork roll. I'm heading next to a diner, and this one's housed inside Asbury Lanes, a bowling alley dating back to the 1960s. There's a lot to do within this renovated historic landmark, as Ferran San Felimon explains. <laughs> State of the art, bowling alley, event space, diner. So you can come here and you can grab a drink, see some live music, maybe dance a little, go to the diner, go bowling. I love it, boozy shakes. Cinnamon cereal crunch. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Let's do it. Wow. <gasps> oh my oh goodness. My this looks awesome. Mmm. So oh good. God. Adjoining Asbury Lanes is a hotel. It's housed in an old Salvation Army building that had fallen into disrepair. Welcome to the Asbury Hotel. And cool this space. Yes, it used to be the old Salvation Army building. We decided to keep the brick walls, the steel structure, and then they decided to complete the full renovation and turn it into the hotel. I like how you renovated it, though. This is so fun, using the, the existing window spaces mm -hmm, exactly. as beautiful flowers coming out and plants, and it's super cool. It's neat that you were able to take this building with its history and preserve elements of it and keep that alive while updating it, making it fun and modern. It is very nice and also it's very rewarding to, to see hotel guests coming back, remembering stories from their childhood. So it's very cool to see that. No trip to the Jersey Shore would be complete without hitting an old-fashioned arcade. Patty Barber introduces me to a living, interactive museum at Silver Ball Retro Arcade. How long has this been on the boardwalk? We've been on the boardwalk about 14 years. We came right before things built back up in Asbury. I love the nostalgia, but I also love that you're still bringing in new things. That was a goal of mine when we recently renovated, was to bring us to a place where young people of every age, with every type of person would enjoy us, so that we weren't just pigeonholed into one area where it was just a nostalgic thing. Young people find a game themselves that they really enjoy, and that becomes theirs, but the older games remind people of a time when they played. Love it. Here's Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. The whole family, baby, Mrs. and Pac-Man. And the music, the lights, the whole experience brings everybody together. And we're pretty proud of that because that's what it was all about, just bringing a place where people can forget everything and have fun. So I might have gotten sucked into the games here at Silver Ball Arcade. It's been awesome exploring culture, history, architecture, and more here in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Thanks so much for joining me. Right. I'm not going to get over you, Tim, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> We've only just begun. At the beach, a stone's throw away from the stone pony. Right. Has anyone ever said that? That's actually like... <laughs> That's a lot of pork roll. That's a lot of... This is a lot of pork roll. Yeah. <laughs> it's a theme. <laughs> yeah, a lot of pork roll. <laughs> Do you have a favorite memory of, of playing here? Or is it today, right now, when we're filming? Yeah. <laughs> this is for Bob. 
Okay.